Thank you, Madam Chair. You are now live. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, May 20th, 2021 meeting of the Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee. Uh, I'm uh, Councillor Lisa Blackburn. I will be your, uh, your chair and your host for this morning. And just to uh, go around the ring here to make sure that uh, everybody can be seen and heard, uh, we'll just uh, check in with all of our uh, committee members, starting with uh, uh, Vice Chair Councillor Sam Austin. Sam, good morning. I'm here. Oh, you there we present. go. <laughs> there we go. All right. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Uh, now uh, looking for uh, Councillor Pam Lovelace. Good morning, Madam Chair, here and ready for service. Perfect, thank you. Councillor Trish Purdy, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and everyone. Good to be here. Excellent, all right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lindell Smith. Hello folks, here and ready to go. Good stuff, thank you, sir. Uh, Councillor Patty Cuddle. Sorry, uh, Madam Chair, I believe uh, Councillor Cuddle may have um, uh, missed the link, so I'm just sending it to her now. Oh, okay. We'll catch up with her in a moment then. And uh, we have a couple of uh, guests joining us this morning. Uh, a, a big CPED welcome to uh, Councillor Way Mason. Are you with us, sir? I'm sorry. I believe Councillor Mason may be um, out uh, of attendance today as well uh, at the moment. All right. Joining in a moment. Cool. All right. And uh, our other guest this morning is uh, Councillor Paul Russell from Sackville. Good morning, Paul. Uh, good morning. And uh, I'm glad to be here, especially for one of the reports that we're going to be hearing a lot about. Thank you. Perfect. Looking forward to it as well. And uh, also want to note that uh, Connor O'Day will be uh, sitting in for uh, Kelly Denty. So if we have any questions of a planning nature, then uh, Connor will be uh, pinch hitting for her today. So uh, our first, uh, well, I guess uh, number two on the agenda is the approval of minutes from the April 15th, 2021 meeting. Just looking for a, a motion to approve the minutes. Minutes, Councillor Smith. Mid. All right, Councillor Smith to move, seconded by okay. Councillor Lovelace. Perfect, all right, thank you very much. Uh, any uh, changes or uh, um, additions that have to be made to the, uh, the minutes? If not, uh, I'll ask for a vote on uh, approval of the minutes as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And contraminded? Nay? None? All right. And uh, oh, I see that uh, Councillor Deagle Gammon is going to be joining us this morning as well. Thank you so much, our other special guest. Boy, CPED is the hottest ticket in town. This is great. <laughs> um, Number three, the approval of the order of business and the approval of uh, additions and deletions. Mr. Clerk, we do have some added items today. Can you explain? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we have uh, two added items, an info report related to case 22257 regional plan review themes and directions, as well as a associated presentation. Uh, the um, uh, circulated added item agenda um, uh, lists that as uh, I believe uh, a 12 point uh, number, but uh, that should, uh, that's my mistake. That should say uh, 15.1 and we would add that uh, if approved to the um, added items section of our agenda, the presentation. Uh, okay. I've received a uh, confirmation from uh, all councillors except uh, Councillor Smith. This, uh, this does require unanimous consent. So um, uh, I believe uh, Councillor Smith is present. Uh, if uh, Councillor Smith consents, then uh, we can add this to the agenda. All right, Lindell, the pressure's on you. Do you consent? I don't know. Do I want to? Do I want to mess this up? <laughs> yes, I, I can. <laughs> Thank you, oh, perfect. Thank you very much. And so, just to uh, to further explain, this is uh, this is a pretty beefy report. It's uh, 150 plus pages. Um, it's not expected that any of us would have uh, read this uh, prior to it being added right here today. This is just uh, um, to get it on the uh, on the agenda and out into the public uh, realm so that we can get some uh, some feedback and get the initial presentation. So uh, um, yeah, seeing all have agreed, looking for approval of the order of business as amended. Uh, really Madam Chair. Oh, sorry. Yes, Council Lovelace. 
Uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask that we bring that information item forward uh, to the next meeting. I wasn't sure if I do this during uh, agenda review or after. Uh, I think it's been uh, noted by the clerk's office and uh, the request has been made to uh, put it on the agenda for the next meeting. So uh, Simon Thank will you. make sure that that is done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, approval of the order uh, of business as amended. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, just wondering on the uh, uh, on the added item. So the intent is because it, uh, it, it is an info report that we will get a presentation on it today. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, it wasn't expected that this uh, this report wasn't expected to uh, be ready in time for today's meeting, but uh, the uh, uh, everything aligned and it was ready. But uh, this is just to uh, put it on as an information item. Uh, so that it can be released to the public and we can start getting uh, feedback from the public and the council. Uh, we'll have a, a brief presentation on it today and then a more uh, fulsome, uh, deeper dive on it at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let me see. Um, oh, I see that uh, Councillor Cuddle has joined us. Thank you very, very much. Uh, you're, you're good, we can hear you and see you if you wanna just quickly check in. Yep, hello, uh, coming live from District 11. Um, Perfect, all right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Smith, you had a question, sir. Yeah, really quickly, I wonder if we could move 12.1.1 uh, after 12.1.2. I know Councillor Mason wanted to join, he had a prior meeting, and, and it's just hoping that we could have that, that report after the uh, monthly service youth center evaluation report absolutely so you just want to switch up the order of uh 12 1 1 and 12 1 2 yes please all right um any objection to that from members of committee all right that looks good uh councillor cuddle you had a question as well it was the same question so all oh. good Perfect. All right, then. So uh, looking for approval of the order of business as amended. So moved. So moved by Councillor Lovelace, seconded by. I'll second. Yeah. Seconded by Councillor Purdy. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Motion carried. Uh, business arising out of the minutes. We have none. Uh, call for declaration of conflict of interest. Taking a moment here, if anyone has a conflict, this is the time to declare it. Not seeing any, we'll move on to item six, motions of reconsideration, there are none. Motions of rescission, there are none. Consideration of deferred business, we have none. Uh, notices of tabled matters, there are none. And uh, on to 10, we have correspondence, petitions, and delegations. Uh, Mr. Clerk, 10.1, correspondence. Do we have any correspondence for today's meetings? Thank for today's meeting, Karen, I should say. Through you to uh, standing committee, we have uh, no correspondence received as of this time. All right, beautiful. And 10.2, uh, petitions. Do we have any petitions either from the clerk's office or from the floor? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to 10.3 presentations. And our first is 10.3.1, our HRM Alliance, Seven Solutions. We have Meredith Baldwin joining us this morning. Uh, Meredith is uh, our HRM Alliance coordinator and uh, Kathleen Hall is the our HRM Alliance chair. And uh, I do believe that uh, Meredith is, uh, is with us and uh, Simon, you will be uh, taking care of the, uh, the presentation for her. Good morning, Madam Chair, the Standing Committee. Just want to make sure that Kathleen is here as well. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Awesome. Kathleen, I do think you are for some reason here as Kathleen Frolic, so it might be worth yes. noting that Kathleen is a different uh -oh. Kathleen. I was a touch anxious because I can't answer any planning uh, questions. So, gotcha. Uh, All right. Thank you and good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Councillors and members of the public. I wanna thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. And uh, I am um, currently a director of the Williams Lake Conservation Company, the co-chair of the Backlands Coalition, 
and the uh, chair of the steering committee for our HRM Alliance. And I'm here this morning with Meredith Baldwin, who is our coordinator at our HRM Alliance. She's been with us for two years and she's doing an awesome job. So I just wanted to give you a little background with regard to our HRM Alliance. It's a group of 65 organizations in HRM and we've been around for more than 10 years. We were created when there was a level of frustration um, with municipal government back in 2011. And uh, the energy level was very low and we knew that uh, the plan review was coming up in 2011. And uh, we thought, let's join all together. And the one uh, common thread was that we wanted to make Halifax a better place to live. So we got to work and thanks to our mentor creator, Jen Powley, um, she was able to draft what we call the seven solutions. And I have, I don't know if you can see the book, but um, this was published. And um, the first solution is green belting. So this was, this was put out before um, the regional plan review but we knew where we were headed. And uh, the fact of the matter is, I really knew that we were making some headway when I would go to council chambers and I would see that councillors had our book uh, on their desk and they were not only reading it, they were quoting from it. And I thought, wow, that's real progress. So Emeritus is going to speak to um, some of the other solutions, but my focus is the green belting, which as we know, turned into the Halifax Green Network Plan with a lot of work, uh, an amazing um, final document. And what I'd like to emphasize today is that we really need to make sure that all of the um, Green Network Plan is put into the legislation, that it goes into the new regional plan that will be coming out and it's put into the appropriate uh, pieces of legislation so it will really have effect and impact because so much uh, i don't need to tell you how much development is going on and we need to make sure that we have what is the, what are the key places left so without further ado um i'd like to hand the floor over to meredith thank you very much Thank you, Kathleen. And may I just ask if you would skip ahead about three slides? Thank you. <laughs> um, so just continuing on what Kathleen said, the members of RHRM Alliance, which are now 65 organizations from really every corner and piece of the municipality who come from backgrounds of business, community organizations, trails and recreation groups, and environment and climate groups. So really all across the board came together over the shared goal of basically making our growth make more sense in Halifax. So in the first year, 2011, the Alliance adopted the seven solutions. And yeah, as Kathleen said, we were thrilled that HRM incorporated many of them. And we are now at what uh, the Alliance is considering a really key deciding moment for HRM with the regional plan review. So it is really quite timely uh, that we are here today as it sounds like you're seeing the themes and directions report uh, a major step of that review process. So the updated seven solutions that we're going to share with you um, reflect the progress that HRM has made in those past 10 years, but there's also still a lot to be done. So I'm gonna take you through the solutions very briefly. We do have both a physical copy coming to you and there is a copy online uh, that we'll dive a little bit deeper into some of these things. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide again. <laughs> Thank you. So Kathleen spoke to the first of the seven solutions, which is protecting the Halifax Green Network. And at this moment, we have a plan for the Halifax Green Network, which is fantastic, the Halifax Green Network plan. Um, and the reality is that only a small amount of it has been implemented at this point. 
and that largely the Halifax Green Network isn't guiding our growth. Uh, but if we're serious about protecting wilderness trails, parks, wildlife, uh, and the recreation and tourism opportunities that I believe make this city great, uh, it, it needs to be guiding our growth. So while HRM has taken some really great steps, uh, next slide please, with the Shaw Wilderness Park uh, contributions to protecting Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes, it's only part of the puzzle. We have a need to protect the corridors that connect the key wilderness spaces in the municipality, uh, properly use land use designations, zoning to protect uh, important green space. We need direction to protect key wilderness spaces and we need a plan for stewardship. Next slide, please. So the flip side of this is building complete communities in HRM. Right now, we have about 35 growth centers in our regional plan. And um, from the Alliance's opinion, this is too many to channel growth into complete communities. And multi multiple of these conflict with wilderness hotspots and also multiple wouldn't have access to public transit. It's 2020, we, we need to be growing in only ways that build complete communities in our city where we have access to a grocery store, where we can walk and roll, bike, bus to everything that we need, where we can be close to work, close to essential services. And the last Halifax Housing Needs Assessment said, this is what the majority of us want. It also said that our growth wasn't reflecting this and it still appears to not be. Next slide, please. So building on this, our growth just isn't making a lot of sense right now. A study that HRM commissioned from Stantec found that HRM could save about 3 billion over 18 years just by concentrating growth. Uh, and the reality is that right now we aren't just allowing sprawl, that doesn't make sense. We are essentially subsidizing it. So there's an opportunity to change the way that we grow in this regional plan review. So we know that building complete communities matters for livability, but complete communities also matter for climate change. Next slide, please. So our sixth solution, um, we must use the regional plan and our growth patterns, our development to act on climate change. A Canadian study found that Sprawling suburban development can have 10 times the per capita emissions than a complete community. We also get immense benefits from the climate mitigation and adaptation through leaving nature in our cities intact. So looking at timelines, there's, this is likely to be our last regional plan review to have an impact on our community before 2030, which is also the year that the IPCC notes that Global CO2 emissions will need to fall drastically to avoid the catastrophic effects of climate change. I'm sure something that we are all hearing and thinking a lot about right now. But we need to see this reflected in the regional plan um, and what we see from and at the end of this review. As the IPP, IPCC sorry, notes, we need to see rapid and far reaching transitions in land energy industry, buildings, transport, and in our cities. And the last solution is that we need to make these changes in a way that centers on actionable engagement in measuring our successes. Uh, next slide. So this has been a great deal of pointing out the problems and some high level solutions um, we obviously don't have enough time to get into some of the intricacies that we are suggesting in the changes that are needed, but Kathleen and I and many of the members of the Alliance who are um, very skilled and knowledgeable in their own communities are happy to continue this conversation, also to talk about what uh, this looks like and means in all of your districts. So. Um, for next steps for you, it sounds like you're seeing the themes and directions report, which is a very exciting next step. Uh, and I know that there is a great team working on that report. So I would just urge you from here, if you believe in these solutions and the future that the Alliance is proposing, that you make sure that the themes and directions report, that the engagement throughout the review and that the final 
regional plan that we see reflects them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kathleen, Meredith, appreciate that. Um, if, uh, if you are up for uh, questions, I will throw the, uh, the floor open. Um, now I, I had to uh, restart uh, my computer halfway through that. So I may have lost anybody who put their name in the chat to speak. Uh, so if you have uh, asked to, uh, uh, if you have any questions for, uh, oh, Patty, I see you've got some comments. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, a big thank you to Kathleen and Meredith um, for the presentation today. You know, I think HRM Alliance is a, it's an incredible organization rep representing so many stakeholders across our municipality doing really important work. And it's not lost on me just how much work has gone into um, your seven solutions and distilling them down into very focused, actionable ideas. And, um, you know, I think in terms of carrying this forward into the regional plan review, you've done a lot of the heavy lifting. And I just want to say, I thank you very much. I thank you very much for that. Um, you know, some of the things that I thought were specifically important were kind of focusing on protecting the key places, you know, your comment around the fact that we are growing and there's a tremendous amount of development and identifying these key places and protecting them now, like now's our chance. Once they're gone, they're gone. And so, um, you know, I think that that's a, a really important piece of um of your work and what we you know something we need to carry forward um also you know what you were talking about around concentrating growth um you know we know there's going to be development but how that development happens the form it takes the kind of transit opportunities and and you know community um, opportunities that presents is is really key to our future um, and I think key to the successes of our community as a whole so um, you know you've articulated that very well and I thank you for that too um, one well, I do have one question I know that you've talked a lot about protecting wilderness areas in in our in our city and have done a lot of important work around that I was just noting that a lot of the slides you presented were actually coastal images and, you know, one of the things that I feel is also very important is, in, particularly in relation to climate action, is sea level rise, um, looking at our coastal communities, looking at what we need to do to mitigate sea level rise, and, and how we work that into our future planning scenarios. Um, you know, one of the greatest things about living in Nova Scotia and living in Halifax is our access to the ocean. So it's only like protecting the land, but also providing those opportunities for people to have public access to our shorelines, being able to access the ocean and the, the recreational or economic um, opportunities that that presents. So um, just throwing that out there and thank you very much. It's nice seeing you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, did you want to uh, reply to that, uh, Meredith or Kathleen? I guess I could say that just yesterday, I listened to an awesome presentation uh, by the um, coastal person at EAC. And she was saying that um, we, although the government, the provincial government brought in the Coastal Protection Act more than two years ago, we're waiting for the regulations to be drafted and meanwhile, there is all sorts of development building going on um, on the coast that is really going to be unsafe. And I think that's a, a shame. And so that is not um, obviously this government, but I would say that whatever can be done um, by the, the councillors and um, the council to move this forward, it's really important. I mean, we, we have to see this act come into play. So Patty, um, you know, good on you for bringing it up and, and ironic that we just yesterday uh, heard this person speak. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for this presentation, Kathleen and Meredith. Um, I, I, have, I do have a couple of comments and questions. Uh, Councillor Cuddle just raised the point that I'm concerned about as well with the sea level rise in District 13 uh, along St. Margaret's Bay. 
And noting, of course, that the provincial legislation is waiting uh, for the uh, regulations to come forward. Obviously, you know, as a municipality, uh, we can certainly request those regulations, but we can't force the provincial government um, to uh, to enact them. When they do happen, obviously, that's when we can roll quite quickly. Uh, my hope is um, to work on that regional plan review to ensure that we're integrating that work into um, our climate action plan and our work within the regional plan. Um, I, I commend you on moving forward and also as, as Councillor Cottle pointed out, it's an incredible amount of work uh, getting us to this point. And I think the next step, of course, is to educate educate the public, educate politicians, help people understand, you know, what these uh, seven solutions actually mean and how they can be implemented in the work that we all do. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether or not this presentation uh, it has been forwarded or will be forwarded um, to CPED so, so we can have that, um, you know, to refer back to. And as, as you've noted, regional plan review is taking place right now. So, you know, we, we is, <laughs> and we're gonna be talking about it later today. So. So uh, I would really like to have um, that presentation in my hand. And I, I will say kudos to all of you. You've got a great website and appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lovelace. And uh, I think this is uh, certainly something that uh, the clerk's office can make sure that we uh, get copies of the, uh, the presentation. Um, seeing no further questions in the chat, uh, I will uh, thank you so much, uh, Meredith Baldwin from uh, our HRM Alliance, the coordinator, and uh, Kathleen Hall from, uh, well, the chair of our HRM Alliance. Very much appreciate your time here at CPED, and uh, thank you so much for your work. Thank you very much for having us today. All right. Fun. See you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right, uh, let's see. Moving on to 12.1.2 uh, uh, as per the amended uh, agenda, the Multi-Service Youth Centre Evaluation. And uh, uh, not sure, Mr. Clerk, is there a, a presentation to go with this or just the, uh, the motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't believe that there is a presentation for this item or for uh, 12.1.1 uh, noise management either, though I will defer to staff okay. if, uh, if I have that wrong. All right, uh, perfect. So uh, looking for somebody then to, uh, well, what is the uh, the wish of uh, committee on 12.1.2? Madam Chair, I can move this uh, motion, get it on Please, the table yes. for discussion. All right, go I'm, for it. Thank you. I move that Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee recommend that Regional Council one, approve the continuation of the collaborative multi-agency, multi-service youth center, the DEN at Acadia School in Lower Sackville. Number two, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to continue to seek opportunities to establish multi-services youth centers in other areas of the municipality based on the approach outlined in the discussion section of April 6, 2021 report. Three, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to adopt the Multi-Service Youth Center model as outlined in this report as the preferred model in the delivery of programs and services to youth in the municipality. And four, subject to approval of funds in the 2022-23 budget, the confirmation of a suitable location and the commitment of the stakeholders, approve the creation of a Multi-Service Youth Center in the Spryfield Herring Cove area. I so move. All right, do we have a seconder? I can second. Well, Councillor Cuddle. All right, Councillor Cuddle, you've seconded. Thank you very much. Uh, any uh, anybody wishing to uh, to speak to uh, to this item? Just uh, sign up in the chat. And uh, Councillor Lovelace, I see you would like to uh, make a comment. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so a few years ago, when I entered the den <laughs> for the first time, I was overblown by how welcoming it was, how happy the young people were, um, how engaged they were in their activities and discussions. Um, but as I became a little bit more uh, knowledgeable in how the workings of the den was actually taking place and how engaged the youth were in that uh, leading overall the organization and some of the programs and, and um, you know, how uh, they were co-designing some of these programs and 
uh, you know, I, I was just taken aback and thought, this is what we need everywhere. <laughs> so um, I know that, uh, you know, this is funding is, of course, uh, the issue. Um, and certainly we're talking about a 2022, 23, the next year's budget. Um, but my, my uh, belief is that this is something that we need to have all over HRM and kudos to everyone who's been engaged in leading this. So thank you so much, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, our uh, special guest who's going to be uh, joining us during public participation is uh, the gentleman who took the uh, the lead on this. And uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from him later on in the meeting. Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Purdy, you had a question. I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was unclear when I was reading the report. I know that the funding comes, but the stakeholders who who partner with HRM to provide some of the services. Um, is, that, is that a paid position as, as a stakeholder? So does, do, does the funding from HRM go to pay the stakeholders or are they volunteering their expertise and time to perform those services as part of okay. the community in engagement piece? Gotcha. All right. Great question. And I think we've got uh, Angela Green uh, joining us and uh, Angela knows the ins and outs of this one. Hi, everybody. I'm Angela Green, a Director of Recreation Programming. So uh, through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor, the stakeholders uh, were recruited, so to speak, uh, through the initial process of setting up the Multi-Service Youth Centre in Sackville. The contribution that they give is through their organization. So if it's the YMCA, there, there's no funding that comes from HRM to a program that the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club or any of the other uh, stakeholders would be providing. So they would be doing that as part of their budget within their organization. All right, thank you. Does that answer your question, uh, Councillor Purdy? It does, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Austin, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Chair. Uh, I'm very supportive of the report and uh, all the work that's gone into that. I know uh, Councillor Craig was quite a champion of it, but went back when he was, before he was demoted. Um, so the one question I have in the, in the report, it referenced, um, you know, criteria to assess where, where we go to next. Um, I'm just wondering, like, uh, I, I, I'm curious as to what communities were assessed. Uh, I have no expectation that um, District 5 would rank very high in them because, I mean, we've got the branch of Alderney Library, Finlay Community Center, and the McPhee Center. Um, it's certainly not an area that uh, I expect would, sorry, I've got a siren going down the street. Um, <laughs> It's going to literally drive right past the door. <laughs> oh, no. And, yeah, there we go. <laughs> as long as it doesn't stop at your house, I think you're in the clear. <laughs> no, it was held up there for a second by a uh, roofing going on next door, too. It's quite a day on the road. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I, I have lost my entire... Oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm curious as to where the other, uh, like... I, I, I kind of would have appreciated right uh, an actual kind of list of where of what else was assessed. Um, you know, I think of places like um, uh, Kennedy Drive over in Dartmouth East, or you know, Dartmouth North. There's a lot of programming going on, but of course, is one of the high higher needs areas too. Um, mm -hmm. Is, I, I would be a little bit, I'd be interested from staff, um, uh, a little bit more commentary on that. And it would be helpful to me if we actually had the list of, you know, what was assessed in looking at future options. I'm not taking away from Spryfield. I fully support the next one going there. Sure. All right. Uh, any comment from, uh, from staff on that? Angela Green, uh, Director of Recreation Programming to you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. So uh, we did go through an extensive uh, evaluation of, uh, of how we chose what the next uh, um, youth, youth centers would be, the locations of them. And we worked with the public safety office to uh, layer in all the different criteria that we use to determine what those locations would be. And we, uh, we do have that list, Councillor. Uh, we can, I can get that 
for you. I don't have it in front of me, but we did what we did. We went through all of the different districts and we um, we evaluated and there was actually a, a number given to each of the areas. And then the top four locations then went through further evaluation. And that's how we came up with the, the one we're recommending. But I can certainly provide that list to you through uh, through the clerk's office for you to have. That would be fantastic. Um, could I request that um, we attach it to the report um, before, when this goes to regional? Because I'm, I'm certain the other councillors who are in the top four would be interested to know that, well, I, I won't be next in line, but somewhere in the next few years, I, can, uh, I have a good expectation that there would be a youth centre because it might be then something that they want to champion at budget time um, accordingly. So uh, I, I think that information will be helpful for us. Sure, absolutely. All right, that's great. Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, and and of course, this is in Lower Sackville, and, and our special guest uh, a little bit later on will will also be speaking to it. I am just thrilled uh, that this has come back to CPED and this got the budgetary approval uh, back uh, earlier this month. Wow, uh, for this. Uh, just wanted to thank my fellow councillors for uh, having a look at the briefing note and, and making sure that they understood uh, and, and recognized uh, the value of this facility. Everybody in the community uh, knows how important this is. And, and what we have been trying to do for a long time is provide more options for our youth, uh, better options for our youth, uh, making sure that uh, our young people have something to do uh, so that it, it just, it, it will enhance those who um, those who have a difficult time in other places, and and I love the concept of of it being multi service. It's it's not just us. We have experts in every field who are able to come out and help people in the way that they need help. There are a couple of restrictions that are uh, in place, basically because of COVID, and and I'm hoping that we would be able to work around those somehow. Um, a little bit of history: the den was open for the year and it shut down and that roughly coincided with uh, welcoming COVID. And it was, we, we tried to reopen it again, um, but it required uh, pre-registration and the cohort that would be most engaged, most able to make use of these services didn't fit with pre-registration. Uh, so I'm just wondering if uh, we could address the idea of registering beforehand. I, I understand the importance of needing to contact trace and to limit the number of people that are in the den. I'm just wondering if there's some option um, other than pre-registration to allow the den to open and just track people as they show up instead of doing the pre-registration. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Uh, uh, Angela Green, do you have a uh, comment? Hi again, Angela Green, Director of Recreation Programming. So I'm going to ask Lee Moore, who's the, uh, the Manager of Youth Programming, to answer this one for us. All right. Beautiful. Lee, good morning. Welcome to CPED. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's Lee Moore. I'm Manager of Youth Programs, as Angela said. Um, to answer your question, uh, Councillor, uh, I am looking, at, my staff and I are looking at ways to make it a little bit more youth friendly, but still meet the public health guidelines. Um, so we are looking at a reopening plan. And of course, this moving forward is, is helping as well to kind of get the report in place. So um, we should have a plan that would be a little bit more youth friendly, um, you know, with our partners and everything to kind of get these things going that is still COVID safe. And uh, it has obviously COVID is impacted a lot of things. So, you know, we're trying to work within the system that we have and uh, hopefully we can get that done as soon as, you know, restrictions are eased a little to allow us to reopen. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, you, uh, you good, Councillor Russell? I just wanted to, again, thank everybody for moving this forward. I am looking forward to seeing the other areas. Uh, this has been an, uh, a wonderful model, a successful pilot, and it is uh, helpful. Uh, it is good to see it replicated. Um, yeah. So just thank you again. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Councillor Cuddle, you have a question. There we go. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I think this is great that this is coming forward. I'm, I'm obviously very excited to see that Spryfield is next on the list. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of need in Spryfield for something like this. We're a growing community. There's lots of, um, you know, many economic challenges in this area and families needing support. You know, the programs that do currently exist for youth are all super well utilized. Many of them are full. Um, so I know a lot of people will be excited to see this coming forward. And I thank Sam for supporting Spryfield as the next location. And I also want to thank uh, Councillor Russell um, for bringing this forward. And uh, I too look forward to seeing more sites around the municipality. For staff, um, I just have a question around, you know, the timeline for the next project to go forward, the one in Spryfield. And I'm also wondering about funding. Like, have we identified year over year funding for this so that you know we can make sure these projects happen after the Sackville one, that the one happens in Spryfield and that we continue to see locations open up across the, across the municipality? Or is this something that we need to bring back to budget um, each year? And also, I'm just wondering in terms of the project, um, well, specifically in Spryfield, but I guess this would apply to anyone, uh, how are stakeholders engaged and what, what kind of stakeholders are engaged? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Angela? Angela Green, again, uh, through you, Madam Chair, to the, to the Councillor. A couple of questions, one around the budget. Uh, we have identified this year, um, over year over year budget for the DEN, which is the $85,000. The, uh, there is there ha was information shared as far as the briefing note that went to council for the budget deliberation about the year over year, which would include the, the second location. However, that wouldn't be required until the 2022-23 budget. So that will be coming forward at our next uh, budget deliberations. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, the plan to actually get the uh, location opened in Spryfield, we have an, an entire action plan that's, uh, that we would be implementing that would start with looking for a, a location because as stated in the report, the, we need to have a dedicated location for, for the site. Um, we would be investigating that. We would be doing an RFP process for the, for the stakeholders. And we have relationships and contacts that we've built through the, through the opening of the den that we would be working with. We also will be looking at uh, doing some uh, public consultation with the youth because the youth, would, the youth lead this process. So the youth will be identifying like where the gaps are, what type of stakeholders that we would be looking for that would meet the needs of the youth in that community, which may be slightly different than what the needs of the youth were in Sackville. So there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done. Um, so once we get the go ahead from council, we will be proceeding with our uh, community developer for youth will be leading that and working through the process to get everything ready to then open the, the new location in the next fiscal year. So starting in 2022. Great. Thank you very much, Angela. And um, I, you know, I, I, I'm here to support that in any way I can. So. Okay, thank perfect. You. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, second time around, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I could talk about this all day. I just find it so fascinating and awesome. So uh, a couple of things for this one. I was concerned actually to see that some of the stakeholders had um, not kind of fulfilled their, their obligation. Um, and that that is a risk moving forward. And just wondering, is there some sort of contract or some sort of mitigation to that, you know, to that risk happening in, in future um, projects? Uh, like if they're, um, and uh, speaking to that as well uh, for the, okay, so I'll just leave that there. Uh, stakeholders, mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing that piqued my interest was the, um, I was wondering how is success measured? Uh, because it's one thing to have a place where kids 
feel safe, which actually is, is success <laughs> right, right there. But how is that measured? And it said better outcomes for youth. So I was wondering what, what does that mean? The better outcomes for youth. And I also thought, wouldn't it be cool to be able to measure the outcomes kind of, you know, years out, like maybe once a year touching base with these youth that are getting older and seeing what the impact of this type of programming can have on, on a youth as they transition out of youth into adulthood. Um, I, I, I just thought that was fascinating. I, I'm one of those kids myself. Uh, it, it was a program that really helped me turn around. I, I could have had a totally different outcome in, in my life. So I know these things are very powerful and I just applaud yeah. HRM for doing this. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Councillor Brady. Uh, Angela, anything there you want to touch on? Sure. Uh, so from what I heard, there were two questions, one around stakeholders and one around like the success of the program. So regarding the stakeholders, yes, uh, Councillor, through you, Madam Chair, the council, there, there were issues with uh, a number, a few of the stakeholders not being able to have the capacity within their organization to be able to fulfill the requirements. We did have a partnership uh, agreement that we required all the stakeholders to uh, sign off on, and it, it identified what the, the criteria was what the expectations were for, for the operation of the multi-service youth center. It's non-binding. So we have, once we initiate these stakeholders, we basically just have the trust that they're gonna fulfill the requirements that, uh, that were within that partnership agreement. Fortunately, we uh, jumped, we were able to jump in as uh, parks and recreation and, and fill some of those gaps uh, where, where the stakeholders weren't able to fulfill their, their obligations. So we, we know that that's a risk. Uh, we work through the RFP process, we'll be able to identify um, kind of upfront what the level of commitment is and, and make sure that the ones who are coming forward are gonna be able to commit to at least a year uh, and, uh, and we'll do whatever we can to make it successful if they can't we would look at other options other stakeholders that we could bring to the table to fulfill those gaps ours would be a temporary solution um, so regarding the the looking at success we do intake forms with all the youth when they sign up for to be participants at the center constantly involving them uh, the youth in in all decision making and and you know, we're looking at successes and, and looking at goals and, and we're looking at goals that can be measured so we can know what our successes are within that, uh, that uh, center. And, and we also I love the idea of doing an impact evaluation for the people that are kind of graduating out of the youth center age group and, and really getting their thoughts. We've had such amazing feedback from the youth, how it's significantly impacted their lives even people who with mental health issues were, you know, able to get past difficult times because of their ability to attend their, their programs at the, at the den. So we know that it's successful and, and it's just a matter of making sure that we have measurable um, outcomes that we can be able to quantify that. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And post-COVID services like this will certainly be uh, needed more than ever. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thanks. I, I just want to make one comment uh, about quantification of data. You know, we're, we're talking about young people in their lives. And so I think it really, the, the, the qualification here um, is the is the fact that these young people are in an area, in a space where they feel welcome, uh, where they can access services, where they can get what they need. And in looking at the numbers that we have here and the, and, and the, and the backgrounds um, that, and the fact that the youth are showing up, that's our success. Um, you know, it, it, it's just overwhelming to me that um, these, you know, this number of, of young people are not being serviced elsewhere and they're coming here and feeling welcome and like they belong. So I just want to, I just want to say the success is they're showing up um, and kudos to you and your staff and the partners and everyone else that are engaged. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lovelace. Oh, sorry, my alarm just went off. The ones with four legs. Um, all right, so uh, seeing no further speakers on the list, uh, I think uh, we have a mover, we have a seconder. Call for the question. Question. Question has been called for. Yes, onto the noise bylaw, absolutely. <laughs> Simon, take us away on the vote. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think in this case, uh, uh, we can uh, do a, uh, a general yay and nays vote. Uh, we, we don't have to do a recorded vote unless uh, specifically nope. requested. Excellent. All right. Question has been called for then. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? Motion carried. Thank you very, very much. All right, we're gonna bounce back up to 12.1.1 uh, and uh, noise management, management and mitigation in downtown areas, the Argyle Street Entertainment District. Uh, what is the, uh, the will of the committee? Do we have somebody who's going to uh, move this? I, I can move that. Mm -hmm. All right, Councillor Cuddle, go ahead. All right. I move that the Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee recommend that Regional Council approve bylaw N206, amending bylaw N200, respecting noise, as set out in attachment B of the March 22nd report. All right. Seconded by Councillor Smith. Excellent. Uh, anybody to uh, to speak on this? I think we were waiting for uh, Councillor Mason to uh, to join us. I don't know. I'll just have a little. Yeah. No, he hasn't been I, able to join us. Uh, that's too bad. I mean, I, I can I can start off on this actually. I don't sure. Mind. Um, while we wait for uh, Councillor Mason, I hope this is in his district. But um, you know, the the noise bylaw. Um, really pertains to where in our city we're seeing a lot of entertainment establishments. Um, you know, this is something that a lot of cities across Canada and across the world have looked into to find, you know, really to strike the right balance between, um, you know, the importance of supporting and promoting our cultural sector and the economic development that it brings with the changing nature of cities where we're seeing more and more and more residential development moving into our downtowns and moving into our urban core. Um, you know, from, you know, my previous work, I know that that can often lead to a lot of conflict. We've seen that conflict in the past here in Halifax. And, um, you know, and it opens up tricky things. Our city, our city is changing. And with that, it brings new, new challenges. So um, I'm glad to see that this is coming forward. Um, I'm glad it's on the table. And I hope we have some discussion about it. Because I think we need to find a solution that's really going to going to work for everyone. Um, you know, the, the last thing we want to do is see fewer of our, our bars and restaurants, um, you know, providing not only the opportunity for live music and um, and social gathering, hopefully again in the future. Um, and, you know, and just the importance that brings to, especially a city like Halifax, where that type of um, entertainment and activity and socialization um, is really a lot about who we are. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, the piece I, I'm a little curious on um, is the 11 o'clock. Um, it sounds like we chose that based on looking at a couple other cities across the country. I'm wondering if anyone from staff can expand a little bit more on that. I'm My initial inclination is that maybe that should be uh, a little bit later to reflect um, <laughs> the actual operating sort of hours down there. Um, but uh, I'd be interested too. It's, un it's unfortunate he's not on the on the call because you know Councillor Mason has been more on the the front receiving end of uh, of this sort of issue since it is his residents who are the ones who complain. 
All right, uh, great question. Uh, staff, who is here to uh, address that one? Uh, Ross Grant with Planning and Development uh, through the chair. Hey, Ross. The counselor. Hi. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, you're you're right on. the The reason that the 11 p.m. is is recommended in the report is because uh, it aligns with uh, the approach that other cities across the the country are taking um, for their their entertainment uh, times uh, when the noise would end. Um, I will note there's an alternative in the report as well that does uh, that uh, uh, council would be able to consider at a later time that does. Um, give the option of aligning the time when the noise, uh, the noise time would end to uh, more closely align with the liquor license and the liquor license establishments uh, in the area. Can I uh, ask, um, in terms of looking, I mean, it's the report references Austin and uh, Sydney, Australia. Um, are there any, did we find any Canadian examples of cities um, with a later hour than 11? Or is it, you know, just in Canada, if we went later than 11, we would be the only one? Thank you for the question. Through the chair. Uh, so the, the cities in Canada that uh, have entertainment districts, the, the noise uh, is typically allowed to go until uh, 11 p.m. So that seems to be the standard across the country. Okay, um, I, I'll, I'll raise it with Councillor Mason since it doesn't look like he has a chance, uh, is going to have a chance to join us. My inclination is that we should make that, I would be fine with aligning it with the liquor law uh, for the area, um, but uh, I would not want to propose that now because uh, I'm interested in what he has to say on it since he spent more time on it as councillor than I have by a wide, by a wide margin. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, councillor <laughs> Smith. Thank you, Chair. And, and I was going to mention exactly what Councilor Austin mentioned around the noise, uh, the liquor license noise bylaw, and and uh, our our potential change. So my question is twofold. So if we were to uh, take the alternative, which would which would align more with the uh, the liquor licenses or liquor reg regulations, have staff looked or discussed with the bids in businesses on the impacts of doing that? Um, does that does that change anything uh, from what we're doing today? Uh, and the it, it gives a, a feedback of when you when staff consulted with the bids. I'm just wondering when that happened and if if it's worthwhile doing that again. Um, because we are we are in, in, in COVID, and I don't know, not not having the timeline on there, I'm not sure if those happened before, before or or after we've been in the the shutdown. Uh, through the chair, thank you for the question, Councillor. Uh, the we did reach out to uh, the bids, um, downtown uh, businesses, uh, the restaurant association, some other stakeholders, uh, and I believe that consultation was done. Uh, early in 2020, um, so it was in fact before the uh, pandemic had had begun. Um, at that time, we didn't have um, uh, the time that we were sort of heading towards with the uh, uh, when the noise would be permitted until with any potential entertainment district. Um, you so I believe, I believe that we um, uh, were discussing that in a, in a general nature with the uh, stakeholders that we were uh, uh, speaking to, but didn't actually have a, a sort of a time. Uh, 11 p.m. Or, or, or whatever the time would be at uh, that, that time. And the, 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 the other question was related to if we were to look at the alternative, have staff did any analysis on what that means? Thank you for the question, uh, Councillor, through the chair. Um, so I'll, I'll just direct to the, to the report. Uh, it notes that um, the what staff found during our research was that uh, the 11 p.m. time is typical across Canada. Um, so, so the recommendation in the report is to, to go with that. Um, as for if the time was permitted to go later, um, uh, I'll also point to the report where it notes that uh, uh, licensed establishments uh, within the establishment itself, the, the noise is uh, regulated by the provincial uh, liquor uh, uh, regulations. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily impact the businesses themselves. Um, other than it would allow noise on the street itself to go later. So it would uh, permit things like patios and that sort of thing to, to go later into the night. Right. So outside of the downtown, if we were to take uh, the alternative two, so say I'll use my, my example of the North End, 
because we have the, the entertainment district that's designated downtown. So if we were to take alternative two, does that does that encompass all areas that would have would have liquor licenses for businesses or just focusing specifically on the downtown? Uh, through, through the chair. Uh, so the amendments would only pertain to the area shown on uh, the schedule attached to the potential amendments. So that would be uh, Argyle Street itself only. Okay. All right. Well, I, I would, and I don't see Councilor Mason, so he probably won't be able to, probably won't be able to get his other commitment. For me personally, I think it'd be, it'd be worthwhile to defer it so staff can do a quick little retweet again to the bid, just because if they haven't had a discussion since the, since COVID and the pandemic has hit us, so it might be worthwhile. Now that we also know what staff are recommending, it might be good to just touch base with them and, and come back at the next meeting. So that's my, that's my I'll, I'll wait to see any other comments, but that, that would be okay. my preference. All right. Uh, uh, this oh, is sorry. They're just jumping in to uh, notify that uh, I have um, uh, confirmed Councillor Mason does have the uh, the link to this meeting and I have uh, uh, just uh, sent a, um, a team's message. Uh, no response yet. I, I believe he may be in, in another meeting at the moment. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, right. he has been communicated with. Perfect. No, appreciate that, Simon. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So um, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, Eric, uh, you wanted to uh, to speak to this? Yes, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to add something else to, to counselor, the counselor's uh, question is, is one of the things when we're looking at this is we're looking at this, I'm just reminding uh, council as planners. And so what we do is we look at um, what is established, um, what is consistent, what is sort of legislation throughout the country. And so we're, we're actually bound by um, what are the best practices, if you will, across the country. So when you, you talk about extending it to a different hour, it's not necessarily that staff are opposed to that or can really do any reconnaissance on it. It's that we're looking at it from best practice. It's not that we wouldn't oppose uh, a likelier uh, a later date. It's just something I wanted to, to put out there that it becomes a bit of a, a decision that goes beyond a, a planner's realm, if you will. So I just wanted to ensure that was put out there. All right. Much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cuddle, you had a question. Yes, I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, to Ross, um, you know, I was, when I was reading through the report and looking at your kind of your jurisdictional scan across Canada, um, one of the things I noted was, uh, I believe it was in Toronto, that they were looking at engaging the provincial government on soundproofing requirements. And, um, you know, uh, sorry, my dog. <laughs> it's my dog. He's, He's much like, more polite than mine are. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, was around around the soundproofing and oh my gosh what what they were doing in some other cities is saying well you know if there's an entertainment venue there or an entertainment district when you come in and build a new condo or something like that the onus is actually on the new building not the established use to mitigate the sound issues um, you know, they really recognized that the entertainment industry was was a huge economic driver in in you know in in these cities, and that they needed to protect it. They needed to kind of protect that um, that piece for all the reasons I stated earlier. Um, so, has there been any thought given to the building code and how you know through triple glazed windows and other soundproofing mechanisms. Um, the new buildings that are getting built in our, in our urban core and, and around our entertainment districts um, can, can better mitigate some of the issues themselves rather than putting the onus on the pre-existing establishments. And we saw that the great example for that in Halifax was on Blower Street when they built the, those condos at the corner of Blowers and Barrington. And there was a bar across the street, I forget what it was called, kind of had like a greenhouse atrium there. And the con there was enough complaints from the people in the condo to shut the bar down, um, even though that bar had been there for a long, long time. So I, I'm just wondering if you looked at that, if, any, um, if anything like that is being considered and, um, and how it might be implemented. 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, Ross? Through the chair, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor. Um, so uh, a couple of a couple things. So Toronto is uh, investigating that at this point. Uh, I'm not aware that they've actually sort of implemented or, or requested uh, necessarily any specific changes, but uh, they are uh, moving to, to, to request some changes from the province for that. Uh, I'm not aware of any discussions uh, taking place in, in Nova Scotia about that at, at this time. Um, basically, uh, in, in terms of other jurisdictions that we looked at, uh, I believe Austin, Texas does have um, certain requirements uh, around uh, soundproofing um, for residential buildings in proximity to some of their entertainment districts. Um, as to exactly what, what they are, I can't speak to at this time, um, but that's, uh, that's the extent of the knowledge we have at this time. All right, thank you very much, Ross. Is that, uh, are you a good counselor, Cuddle? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, I, I get that we haven't looked at that yet and it is a, becomes a multi-jurisdictional endeavor to try to get something like that. And, you know, it's, we're, well, we're almost at the point where the horse has left the barn and that we've had all these new condos go up without really looking at this with any foresight. So, um, but I am, I am interested in that. I don't, in what we might be able to do. Um, and particularly if we see this as, as starting with this one downtown entertainment district and potentially looking at expanding that as our city continues to grow and we create more of these growth centers where um, you're gonna get this conflict in use. Uh, how we might, um, how it might be mitigated in the future. Um, I don't know if we can like request a like, briefing note or have a chat offline about that or, or what the next steps might be. Hmm. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, is that uh, is that something that perhaps a briefing note uh, would be able to uh, to help with, Ross? Is that something that uh, uh, that you guys could, uh, oh, I see Donna has uh, popped up. Donna Bootlier, did you uh, want to comment on that? Um, yes, I just wanted to comment with respect to the building code. Um, if there aren't any measures in the building code right now, uh, the uh, HRM can't, um, can't put those in place. It has to be done through uh, amendments to the building code uh, regulations for Nova Scotia. Uh, we have, uh, in other instances, uh, made requests to the province to add certain things to the building code. Uh, and uh, it really, at the end of the day, it's up to the province whether or not they, they add those things. Um, so if there is a um, general desire on the part of council to uh, look at that type of thing, um, then it would be uh, council would... Um, make a request. Um, throw a motion to um, request add something to the building code. Uh, we've done that in the past on, on other matters, but it would have to come from council uh, and ask to the province. All right. Thank you very much, Donna, for the clarification. Um, that's, uh, does that uh, help in any way, Councillor Cuddle? Yeah, absolutely. That does help. Uh, thank you, Donna. And thank you, Ross. Perfect. All right. So uh, previously, uh, Councillor Smith had uh, mentioned a deferral and Vice Chair Austin has a comment on deferral. Go ahead. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I get where uh, Councillor Smith is coming from on that. Um, uh, <clears throat> I, I'm wondering if deferral is really necessary right now where, um, I mean, it'll be what, two weeks before this comes to regional council. I'm just wondering if in those two weeks, whether uh, staff could, uh, you know, whether that conversation could happen with the bids. Uh, with the bids uh, during that time, um, rather than slow this down for a whole month, um, ver uh, which is what it would take, right, for us to see it back mm -hmm. here, only to then refer it to regional. Um, and that would, of course, also um, carrying on to regional rather than deferring. I mean, um, if whatever Councillor Mason's input is, uh, if he can offer it at regional then too. So if we wanted to move something mm -hmm. on as an alternative, we could, op we could opt to do it there. Um, you know, I, that's, that's just my own take. I always look at committees. Well, it's kind of your dry first run at things. Um, you always have a second crack at it. 
Thank yeah. you. All right, thank you very much. And uh, just like that, uh, Councillor Mason has knocked on the door and uh, I do believe that he is uh, he has come in. Uh, Donna Bootler, you wanted to make a quick comment before we go to uh, Councillor Mason? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, sorry, I I just, it just, make. oh, sorry, it just popped up on my, uh, my screen for whatever reason. Uh, okay. Let's see, Councillor Cuddle? You had a comment? Oh, just about the consultation piece with the, um, with the bids. Uh, I might also add in there, um, you know, um, Pop Explosion or Music Nova Scotia. They've also been doing a lot of work around this. So um, I have to add them to the, I'll just add them to that list. Thanks. All right. Thank you. And uh, I do believe uh, Councillor Way Mason is joining us now since uh, this is deep in the heart of his district. Uh, Councillor Mason, did you have anything that you wanted to uh, add to the conversation? Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. Second of all, my power, no Scotch power, power went out uh, 15 minutes ago. And so it's been a real struggle to get back online with rebooting everything. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, Councillor Austin makes a good point. Uh, I'm not sure where we're at, what motion's on the floor, and if there's a motion to defer, because I just got here. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, if we want to just put it ahead to regional council, and then we can consult with the downtown bids specifically and the bids generally, and if they want more time, we can defer it when it gets to council. But I, I, I'm good either way. Like, I, I think it does need more conversation. Certainly, uh, the impression I've gotten, knowing this is coming from staff, is that the downtown businesses on the bar, and uh, I, I don't expect them to be happy with the nine o'clock stop that they were angling for a two o'clock stop. So, all right, thank you very much, Councillor Mason. Um, let's see. Uh, so it was Councillor Smith that initially uh, sort of toyed with the idea of uh, doing the referral. Uh, how are you feeling about that now, Councillor Smith, that now that we've heard from uh, Councillor Mason? So if we could um, maybe, uh, trying to think of the wording here, approve pending information or supplementary report, like how could we do it where it would go to council and then we, I know staff heard that we'd like them to consult again, and I don't mind approving it as long as when it comes to council, we can have that discussion. So could we approve it pending a uh, supplementary report? What's the, what's the best way to-, to So what you're it? looking for is uh, a, approval, move it forward to regional council, but uh, when it does go to regional council, have this added information as part of the package? Right. All right. Uh, I'll defer to Simon on uh, on this one. Is uh, is this something that requires a, a separate motion, or is it just something that uh, we can uh, we can do here? Uh, take the vote, and uh, it's uh, oh, we see that uh, Eric has a, a comment. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to note that if if we're looking at getting out to the bids and the additional groups in two weeks. That's a very tight timeline, uh, particularly given that the same group is bringing forward uh, center plan package B um, over the next week and a bit. So um, if you could push it to a future regional council meeting or some other mechanism by which we, we have a little more time to return back. Gotcha. All right. Thank you so much. So if I'm uh, if I'm uh, hearing correctly, uh, getting this information is uh, is not a problem, but uh, doing it within the two week time frame is a bit of an issue. So it might be better to defer to uh, the following meeting. Sorry, I saw Councillor Mason put his hand up. Oh, Councillor Mason, go ahead. I guess it depends on how intense we want that. I mean, uh, I, I think now that it's public, we can just, uh, I, I will solicit before the council meeting, uh, you know, Paul McKinnon to get back to us. And if they indicate there's a problem, then we can put the pause on then. Either way, it doesn't matter. I mean, if, if we need a pause, it get paused then. If we want to wait now, we can put it off a month. But, uh, but I think we could, I guess what I'm trying to say definitively is I think we can put it forward to council. I had originally asked Councillor Smith to delay it, but I think that uh, some good points were made by Councillor Austin and I think it'd be okay to go ahead. We still have time to get that input. 
All right. Not Eric. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Understanding the pressures that they are under over there. No, nope, much appreciated. Right. Councillor Smith, does that uh, uh, take care of your uh, your concerns there? Really, what I think we could do, because I don't think we need to do some uh, a, a very intense uh, engagement. It would be maybe just a letter from from staff. Hey, we're consulting. Provide us feedback by this date. And whoever responds, responds. And if there's, and I know Councillor Mason will will do his thing to touch base with them directly. So if even if it's just staff, send the send ask for the the bids and whoever else the stakeholders to provide comments by I don't know the, the council meeting. And if there's anything that pops up, as Councillor Mason said, we could we could. Uh, we could defer it then, but it doesn't have to be a full fledged supplementary report. It's as long as staff can reach out between council and the now and and if there's anything that that comes forward, it just gets flagged when it comes to council. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Donna Bootler, you had a comment. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, through you to the councillors, I just wanted to point out that we have been advised in the past that uh, uh, standing committees and community council should not be uh, rec uh, requesting supplementary reports that would then go to regional council. It's up to regional council as a whole to request a supplementary report. So if you're requesting a supplementary report at CPED, it would have to come back to CPED. It would not go forward to regional council. Uh, another thing to consider is this is a bylaw amendment. So the next meeting of council would be the notice of motion for the report and then first reading would probably happen uh, based on the, um, the schedule. First reading would probably happen in late June. Uh, so there is also opportunity for the, uh, the bids and the to the report uh, through correspondence to council um, to, uh, to comment on, on the bylaw. So those are those are some options for uh, committee to consider. All right, beautiful. Thank you very much. And uh, Vice Chair Austin, you had a quick comment. A uh, bonus one. <laughs> uh, mainly, I just wanted to say I, I think I'm where our lawyer is in terms of advice. I mean, uh, rather than a staff formal engagement sort of consultation thing, I mean, I think we're at the stage where, um, and we see this all the time with lots of issues that come through City Hall. Um, the This is being made public. The bids will certainly know about it. Um, I think between the lot of us, there's enough channels that um, other folks who have an interest can be made aware of it. And if they have concerns, they can then they can then write us and say, you know, we object to X, Y, Z, or we think you're on the right tra track. We have no concerns. And then we can, as council, do what we what we will with it. I mean, that's it, there's many issues that play out that way for us, and uh, I don't see why this has to be any any different. I mean, I think the main question is is 11 o'clock too or too early, or should it be two o'clock to align with the liquor licenses? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Seeing no further uh, speakers in the chat. Um, uh, it sounds to me, Councillor Smith, that uh, you're you're willing to uh, forego the uh, deferral and uh, push forward on this today and uh, move it on to Regional Council for uh, further discussion. Yeah, it, it will, it will, we'll do our reach out and staff, I know, will reach out and say, hey, give us some comments if you have any issues and we'll discuss it when it comes to Council. So good to move forward. All right. Sounds good. All right, seeing no further uh, question, uh, sorry, comments, uh, call for the question. 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 Question has been called for. All those in favor, aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, staff for uh, clarifying some of the issues for us here this morning. Uh, moving on to 12.2 uh, members of standing committee. We have nothing there. 12.3 community design advisory committee. No report from them. 12.4 uh, heritage advisory committee. We have uh, nothing from them this month. We have no motions. Item 13, uh, item 14, no in camera items. 
But moving on to uh, item 1551, we do have an added item, case 22257, the regional plan review, the themes and directions presentation. And uh, it appears that we have a cast of thousands here for us today. We've got uh, Kate Green, Le uh, Leah Perrin, Emily Pothier, Kathleen Freilich, uh, Shiloh Kempton, and Eric Luchik, who are all standing by. And we do have a, uh, a presentation, so I'll throw the floor over to them. Thank you, Chair Blackburn. I'm just wondering, uh, Simon, if I could get promoted again. I had to log out a couple of times uh, just to keep my internet happy. Absolutely, sorry, just a second. Can everyone see that? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for adding us to the agenda today. My name is Kate Green and I'm the Regional Policy Program Manager and I'm very happy to be here today to present on our theme and direction report. So normally we would be in council chambers and you would see a team behind me of nervous people with binders uh, there to support this project. It's a large project. So I wanted to make sure you could see the team who are all here today. Uh, you've already read out our names, but um, it's a pleasure to work with this group. They're an incredible, incredible group of people. And uh, it's, it's nice for our whole team to land here today. As well, um, I just want to note that uh, a project like this is large and it involves many people across the organization. So we've been working with lots of people over the past year. Uh, the members of our steering committee are listed as well as some of our key contributors, contributors, contributors uh, who have worked on the project with us and help us get the material uh, just so, so it's ready uh, to go in front of uh, community planning and economic development today. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of our presentation today, uh, why are we here today? What are the themes and directions and how are we engaging the public are the key questions we'll be asking. This is uh, really our first step in the regional plan review where we are releasing public uh, material to the public. Um, so the theme and direction is a, a major deliverable and you're our primary advisory body. So you're the people we are working with most closely on getting this content right. Um, and this is our first stop with you, after which we kick off a month-long engagement period. And our common period, uh, it will close on July 2nd, so it's a month long. Uh, we will have, uh, uh, we have had a memo go out to all of council uh, that went out this morning. Um, we, our website is live today, so this is really a, a quite a big milestone in the project. Just to refresh everyone and members of the public, uh, the Halifax Regional Municipal Planning Strategy is a strategic document, and it was really the first document that, from a planning perspective, covered the entire municipality and created a vision for how we wanted to grow as a municipality. It was first adopted in 2006, and it outlines where development, uh, where land use should occur uh, between uh, 2006 and 2031. So this is just to give you a sense of the regional plan and how we expect it to move through that time horizon, 2006 to 2031. Our first regional plan was in 2006. We did a review and updated it in 2014. This is our second review. We are expecting a first draft of amendments to be uh, ready uh, in 2022. And it's the second review of the plan. Uh, the end of this plan horizon is, is 2031. And I do want to emphasize that between 2014 and, and 2020, when we sort of kicked off this work, the council and the municipality and staff and, and the public have undertaken a lot of work together. So we have uh, created the integrated mobility plan. We've created the green network plan. We created Halifax 2050. We're continuing to work on the culture and heritage priorities plan, sharing our stories. Um, we created an economic growth plan. All of those um, studies uh, were 
identified in that 2014 regional plan as something that should come to be to better inform the next update to focus in on key issues. So the regional plan can be a fairly powerful document in shaping change. <clears throat> so this is a more detailed look at our review timeline. Again, 2022 is our target for delivery of the draft set of amendments to council. We've completed phase one with uh, which where we initiated the project in February, 2020. We've done a lot of research and early engagement over phase one. We are in phase two now with the release of the theme and direction document. We will conduct broad engagement over the course of this, as well as a lot of committee engagement. And in phase three, uh, which will happen sort of after this engagement period closes, we'll do additional research, we'll draft a first set of amendments and undertake broad engagement on those amendments, um, after which we'll update the document and hopefully move into an approval process. <clears throat> So coming back to that second question, what are the themes and directions? These really represent the key ideas, issues, and potential changes we'd like to see in the document. Uh, it really shares the ideas about key planning issues that are on the table and provides details of the work that will be completed. So it's to demonstrate the scope of the regional plan. And it's a chance for us to go to the public and say, have we got this right? These are the ideas that were represented in a lot of the documents that we've been working on over the past number of years. We're bringing them all together into one sort of strategic vision. What do you think? Um, so this really feedback that we get will sort of tell us, is this the right direction? Are we heading in the right, the right way with this, this review? So we wanted to boil all of uh, this large document. We recognize it's large, but we wanted to make sure you had the foundation of, of really what is quite a substantial piece of work, the regional plan. Um, we wanted to make sure you had that in the theme and direction report that we provided to you, but we boiled it down into key um, principles, key ideas. And this uh, has actually gone out to uh, mayor and council today as well and is posted on our website. Uh, so we're calling this, this is part of the key ideas document, what, what we'll go over uh, here now. And the first idea is that we can decide how we want Halifax to grow. So we can really build the kind of city we want to see Halifax become. The growth we're experiencing really offers us an opportunity to shape and mold Halifax. But we know that as more people choose Halifax as a home, we have to quickly adapt to accommodate that growth. Many of our citizens are vulnerable to the pressures that exist in our housing market today. We need to be deliberate in thinking about uh, our connections to other places in the province. And by being very clear about well, where change will occur, we can organize municipal and provincial investments in infrastructure to support the long-term fiscal, environmental, and social health of the municipality, Nova Scotia, and the Atlantic region. So it's really about making smart decisions directing growth quickly to the right places in a way that furthers our goals and all, also builds a healthy, thriving economy. We can create change through new partnerships. Certainly, we need to act on our commitments to change and make it a priority. Uh, we need to continue to educate ourselves on legacies of colonialism now moving forward. Uh, we need to have an unbiased and concrete understanding of our shared history and the culture and traditions of the Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq who are the first peoples of the land we are operating on. The spirit of reconciliation is in relationships. We also need to learn and value the past histories of our African Nova Scotian communities while acknowledging their current realities. We have to work together to identify and change policies that have furthered structural racism and disproportionately impacted these communities and residents. So we need to partner in action. So this, uh, this particular uh, idea represents that we need to act and use the regional plan to act on those new partnerships, grow in a new way, and pursue opportunities for change together. We can make it easier for people to move. So this is really pulled from the integrated mobility plan. We've heard a lot about congestion, commuting, traffic, safety. We know that's a part of what council has been talking about. We know that North American cities have been built for cars, and we know that cars are an inefficient way of transporting large numbers of people, especially during peak hours of traffic. So we need to rethink how we're building our city so that it becomes easier for citizens to move, that we build places that are people-oriented while we grow. We need to think about the region, where people live and how they move about for their daily activities, affects finances, affects work-life balance, and helps determine a carbon footprint. 
These factors are important for physical activity, social interaction, access to nature, mental health, and well-being in connecting communities. We can also protect what matters. Halifax is a beautiful place. We know that. Our region is uh, stunning. We have a unique blend of city and nature that we cherish. This really came out in the branding work that we did a number of years ago, and I like to emphasis emphasize it. I think it's a really important part of what is so special about our region um, and, and certainly how we manage the land in our region. Uh, we, many of our communities are, are centered on their little piece of our stunning Nova Scotia coastline. We talked about that earlier tonight or to this morning. Um, others have grown around our abundant lakes and waterways. So our rural communities showcase our rich traditional and working landscapes and our city center connects us with our visible history. We continue to add beautiful public spaces. Our suburban areas have special wilderness and natural areas that we know are critical to protect. So we want to protect and celebrate these rich resources for the Halifax of today and tomorrow. We can really protect what matters and we can use the regional plan to strengthen and protect important natural and cultural places and use them to shape our region's communities. That is really what we're seeing coming out of the Green Network Plan and uh, the Culture and Heritage Priorities Plan. And finally, what we've been realizing as we reflect on where we're at, both as a society and as we do this big piece of work, the regional plan, we realize we need to transform. And I think you definitely heard some of that conversation at budget and um, in thinking about how we organize ourselves strategically right now, because we are growing so quickly and there are a lot of changes at play. Um, we are resourceful and community minded as a people. We know that Halifax is one of the best places to live in Canada and COVID-19 has shown us that we can band together and our social networks in Atlantic Canada are very strong. So we know we need to do even more to protect our vulnerable citizens. That's become evident. We need to focus on housing. We need to focus on creating greater well-being for newcomers and people of all ages and abilities. We need to see the city through the lens of many and not just the majority, and we need to look ahead. Uh, we need to leapfrog and, not plan, and plan not just for current growth, but the growth that is coming and coming at us quickly. We are at an important point in Halifax's journey and in our global journey in fighting the pandemic, decolonizing and acting on climate change. So uh, there is no shortage of uh, things that we need to work on. But this idea of transformation, I think, has certainly been something we've been reflecting on and the idea that, you know, we can really leapfrog if we take the right steps right now. So I'm not going to get into the next uh, slide in too much detail. They're basically images that represent the themes and directions. Um, and certainly the document that you've received goes into these in, in great detail. These are really the high level items that we pulled out. Maybe you could call them the biggest moves that we are talking about making in each theme. So the theme, first theme is about considering the regional scale. That's the strength of the regional plan. It allows us to direct growth, uh, to manage sprawl, to have a firm service boundary and to be careful about where we expand that service boundary. Uh, one of the things I'll point to is that we're recommending lifting the urban reserve designation from the Acoma properties, which we know is something council has been um, really wanting us to act on. So we're, we're suggesting that. Uh, theme two, building healthier, more complete communities. That's really about the second layer of planning that we do, which is the center plan, the suburban plan and the rural plan. That's about how do we look at a, almost a community level and think about how services and infrastructure is organized and how do we intensify within kind of our existing, existing communities. We also know that councils asked for policy guidance for suburban development proposals and a review of conservation design policies. So that's included in that bit of work. Um, theme three is about reconsidering employment and industrial lands. Uh, we've worked with real estate over the past uh, year or so. They've done a review of industrial employment lands. So we'll be taking that work into the regional plan and updating our work. Certainly we know there's pressure on making sure we have enough uh, industrial land uh, being brought online. Um, we wanna support rural economic development. That theme has come through very clearly in a lot of our work. Uh, and we do employment modeling. We'd like to do some work around that employment trend modeling. Uh, theme four is about transforming how we move in our region. This is the IMP part of the plan. Uh, we need to update our mode share targets. We've heard a lot about 
revisiting the urban transit service boundary. So that's where we'll be doing that work, where we'll be looking at the transit boundary and how it aligns with uh, where people live today, as well as where we're going to be um, growing in the future and, and I, thinking about putting more housing. Uh, we also know we need to do some work around rural mobility. So that uh, falls within that theme area. Social planning for community well-being. Our council has been uh, over the past sort of two councils incredible, shown incredible leadership and in thinking more about uh, the social well-being of our community. So we work with the social policy committee and uh, we're focused on affordable housing, connecting communities and food policy. Under that particular um, theme area, we uh, have a section on community engagement. And that whole theme area is really about how we get into our community and partner as a community to support people. Um, so you'll, you'll see a lot about um, how, how we're working on that as a municipality right now and building on that work. Um, we also know we, we I've mentioned already in our key priorities, we want to support the work that's already happened um, through the Cornwall's task force report and the road to economic prosperity uh, that's been brought forward in partnership with the African Nova Scotia community. So those two pieces of work have a lot of planning influences. So we're very focused on that through uh, that theme. Theme six, celebrating culture and heritage. We've got a bit of a pin in that one. We're waiting on sharing our stories to be done. That's coming forward to you soon. Uh, but we we think that's a, a wonderful piece of work and we're looking forward uh, to hearing more about that and bringing that into, into our work. <clears throat> Theme seven is integrating community facilities and parks. So this is about where are our schools, libraries, emergency services, all the community facilities located, where are parks located and how does that relate to our development and getting really organized around growth. I know you hear Councillor out that say, we built Bedford West, but we, we didn't really plan the infrastructure for it. And certainly Bedford West came online much more quickly than anyone anticipated. But this is really uh, trying to integrate our work to say, OK, school board, OK, library, OK, emergency services. This is the plan. This is the population growth we're projecting. This is where we're thinking of placing it. How does that work with your facility planning? So we'll be reaching out to those groups and really making that a consideration in how we allocate growth. Um, theme eight, enhancing environmental protection. Um, this is really uh, the theme that represents a lot of our work in the Green Network Plan. So we know that the Green Network Plan identifies the protection of wildlife corridors as a priority. Uh, we need to study that more uh, to figure out a method of work. We've been working closely with um, members in the community to try and sort through what an appropriate approach is. Uh, we also need to think about what our ability is to protect environmentally sensitive or important lands. We have certain authorities under the charter, so that's another piece of this work. Uh, and we want to protect water courses, so we're talking about increasing the setback, and we talked about coastal protection, so we're looking to the Coastal Protection Act to give us some guidance around that, but in the interim, we're also studying the coastline and the vulnerability of the coastline through work in Shannon Miedema's team, and also with Erica Fleck, studying where we're most vulnerable. We've done LIDAR, clone LIDAR now, how we want to study our coastline to understand how it's most vulnerable. Uh, so we're setting up that study in the regional plan. Theme nine, uh, again, I've spoken a bit to this leading through action on climate, but this is really what we learned in Halifax 2050 is that we're pretty well organized from a land use perspective. Um, in, in terms of how we are impacting uh, uh, car carbon neutrality, uh, but we need to rethink energy systems and how we're building. So is there a way that we can um, talk to that in our land use documents to support those initiatives? Um, theme 10 is imagining HRM into 2050 and beyond. So this is really about the future. <laughs> Sometimes we joke we're confused about what year we're in in the regional planning team because we're thinking about a lot of different uh, horizons all the time. Uh, but the next plan will be coming forward in our world relatively quickly uh, in 2030. Um, so we need to start to plan for that now. And because we're growing so quickly, really we're starting to push up against the edge of what we had envisioned would happen by 2031 within the municipality. So this is when I talk about leapfrogging. We really got to get uh, a move on thinking about that future state and, and planning for different scenarios. 
And finally, theme 11, uh, we thought it was important to have a place and space for talking about COVID-19 and how we think it will change our society, uh, how it impacts people who are most vulnerable and make sure that we consider a broader impact over time. In, in addition to that, <laughs> uh, we know that council wants to delve deeper um, into key uh, topic areas. So uh, we'll be releasing issue papers, which are uh, even more technical documents around key topic areas. Uh, that have come up in our first phase of engagement and as we've watched council over the, the past number of months. So obviously housing is top of mind for everyone. Um, so we have done some preliminary housing and population analysis. So we've projected our population forward out uh, using a couple of growth, uh, different growth trajectories uh, to 2031 and 2050. And uh, we have thought about where that, how that population might um, result in new development. And then we've studied how much capacity there is within uh, the land to accommodate that population, either by way of infill or uh, bringing new future service communities online, new communities online. Uh, so our plan is to actually uh, bring that forward to Committee of the Whole on June 8th. Uh, we think it's important enough that we think that that should be released at council along with the affordable housing issue paper uh, because we know how important those topics are and we know council will receive a lot of questions we're intending to release that and bring that forward at committee of the whole uh, there's a paper on density bonusing so we know council has been talking a lot about wanting an approach uh, beyond the center plan so we've created uh, we've drafted up an option uh, that would, could apply region-wide in the suburban and rural communities. Um, so we've sort of borrowed from the approach that's been undertaken in the center plan in the growth nodes. So we'll be putting that out for uh, council's consideration. We've, we've also crafted um, papers on suburban community planning and rural community planning. So these are really the beginning of the vision and the frameworks for those future planning processes that we know we want to undertake at sort of the secondary plan level. So the regional plan can set up that work and say, this is what we think it should look like. This are, these are the most important ideas. These are the, the, this is the way we envision this should happen when thinking about it from the regional perspective. So we also have created some surveys attached to those documents. They really sort of outline um, the design ideas or the community, um, community, uh, planning ideas that we think are most important um, based on what we've been hearing uh, that we should be thinking about as we move forward with that work. So I suspect a lot of the councillors will be interested in that material and I want to emphasize that those are just a beginning. Um, they are just a way to sort of have that initial conversation about what is most important in thinking about uh, these frameworks. And then last but not least, we have created an open space primer. Um, as you heard in the presentation earlier, there's a lot of focus on how we protect uh, what has been referred to as the green belt areas or wilderness areas, important ecologically sensitive areas. And we only have certain abilities under the charter to protect that type of land. So we wanted to make sure that everyone was working from the same place in understanding what our powers are really as a municipality to work with that kind of, um, work with that kind of land, uh, that kind of land use um, approach. So that open space primer just really uh, tries to explain to the public and to everyone who's interested in this uh, exactly what our power is, what we view our powers as being, and, uh, so we can all work from the same place. Uh, how are we engaging the public? So um, this is really the uh, 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 intense time to be engaging, but we're, we're saying that we want to go out and rely on our virtual tools, but really also um, bolster that with pushing out through our community networks. So we'll use social media and print media. Uh, we do have a lineup of local newspapers we'll be pushing this word out through, but we'd like to rely particularly on council networks and our local community networks that we have to get the word out. So we receive great feedback from across the region. 
Um, we will be available to provide virtual presentations to stakeholder and community groups along the way. Uh, there's a number of virtual engagement tools that will be uh, going live um, over the coming weeks. The point of truth, the point of the source for everything is really shape your city. And um, we've also, we're also gonna be running uh, to uh, quite a few standing committees, advisory boarding committees, um, and we also will be meeting with internal staff teams as they so uh, so wish. So um, <clears throat> we've got a pretty intense couple months laid out, but we're looking forward to getting out and, and sharing this information. Uh, so this is just uh, a, the, the thing we are putting everywhere to, to, to learn more, to ask questions, join the project mailing list and make your voice heard. Those are the three main avenues, the website, uh, email us or call us. Um, so this is just a calendar of events to give you a sense. We're at the 20th today um, and we're, we're live today. We're pushing out today. Uh, we are heading out to a number of committees. Uh, as you can see, this is the list of them. We have a cow tentatively scheduled for the 8th. Uh, we have a number of virtual Q&As on the key topic areas we felt have kind of raised, been, been uh, come up to the surface through early engagement. Um, so those will sort of be a presentation with key staff, for example, on mobility, we'll have Tanya Davis there, we'll have Aaron Blay and Patricia Hughes, uh, Dave Espeseth, people from the IMP team, Dave McIsaac. So we'll have that group there with us that we work with regularly to help answer questions and have a bit more of a detailed conversation with the public on mobility on the 16th. Uh, but you can see our topic areas there. We'll... Uh, close our comment period, our formal public comment period on the 2nd of July. Um, we have a few more committee meetings that we will do in July, just with scheduling, we've had to push out a little bit. Uh, but at that point, uh, we want to close the comment period so we can uh, consolidate material and analyze material. And uh, our, what, we're heard, what we heard report would come back to CPED on August 19th. Um, <clears throat> We also have the intention of coming back to, uh, as part of that, coming back to CPED and also to Regional Council, ideally Committee of the Whole in early September to talk about the resourcing plan for the work and really get clear on what are we doing um, over the next couple of years? What are we focused on? Where we only have limited uh, resources and housing is such a huge priority, we really wanna be sure that uh, council is on board with the approach that we're taking and, and really get organized as a municipality on what's going to help us uh, move quickly towards, um, towards uh, solving uh, our part in that equation, which is making sure our regulations are, are set up in such a way that, that housing can come online quickly. <clears throat> so uh, important dates just for you. This is the summary slide. That's our Shape Your City. Uh, website. Uh, our overall overall common period again is May 20th to July 2nd. Our surveys will run June 2nd to July 2nd. Our virtual presentation uh, Q and A's are listed there by date. And uh, again, our source of information is the Shape Your City website. So uh, at this point, uh, this is our release. And we are happy to come back. Um, we know you're, you'll want us back at your next meeting, but we're happy to come back and meet with you uh, because you are really the people who will champion and lead our work on this. So uh, we look forward to working with you over the coming months and, um, and helping to build a plan that will really uh, guide Halifax in the coming years. All right, thank you so much, Kate. That was uh, that was uh, pretty action packed, and uh, you've got uh, quite the busy uh, month and a half ahead of you for sure. Uh, any questions from uh, members of committee? I see uh, Councillor Lovelace. You have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Woohoo, Kate! Wow, it's, this is like a gift <laughs> that you've given us. Thank you so much. It's a ton of work. Um, congrats to you and your team. I know you and I have been chatting quite a bit uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'm just thrilled that we're here at this point. Um, I just have two quick questions. When you were talking about the open space, um, you know, 
one of the things that, uh, you know, in the issue paper, one of the things that I, that I feel like we really need is uh, an issue paper on legislative li limitations, you know, specifically uh, to help not just counselors, um, but really to help the public understand, uh, you know, that we do have this lane that we need to stay in. And we don't have uh, the legislative authority that a lot of folks think that we do. Um, and when it comes to protection of waterways and, you know, wilderness areas and that sort of thing. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there um, where it is really helpful, of course, to maybe embed some of that legislative um, uh, legislative limitations in those issue papers, uh, ju just to kind of think think about that. And the other question that I have for you is around um, the resources. And one of the things that I'm struggling with as a, as a new counselor coming on board is a, um, I feel like there's a missing element of stakeholder management. Um, and wondering where, where are we with actually having a database um, information management approach to who our stakeholders are and how we're engaging with them. And so I just wanted to ask you if that's something that you guys are developing. Is it is it already in existence and I don't know about it? Um, so thanks, Katie, I appreciate that. All right, thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Um, did you uh, wanna make a, a quick comment, uh, Kate? Sure, yes. Uh, so uh, through the chair to the councillor, thanks. Those are really interesting questions. Uh, we do uh, speak about our legislative authority a fair bit. That open space primer is a first uh, crack at that. So I'll be interested on your take on that primer and how it responds. Um, I think also, you know, this is something we've come up against in the housing conversation. What is our role? What is our lane in housing? And are we expanding it or not? Uh, so I think your suggestion of being clear about what our responsibilities are, our powers are, and embedding that into the conversation, we try to do that and we'll be, uh, we can definitely do that more if, if you would like that. So that, that's a yes to that. Uh, and we agree. Um, to the second question, um, you are speaking to my heart right there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so this is a municipal wide, uh, I'll call it a problem, but uh, we don't have a central database. So, you know, sometimes we're out engaging with citizens and they're saying, well, we told you this in 2007. Why haven't you done anything yet? So we have embedded a quasi consultation database into our refresh of uh, the planning, permitting and application system. So what we intend to do is sort of have a way of recording consultation um, information in that database and we're trying to create um, <clears throat> a special node that would do that for us. I haven't actually been engaged in that work for a little bit, uh, but uh, expect that to come in the next like, you know, two to three years. Uh, but that is one thing we're trying to do. All right. Thank All you very right. much. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, thank you, Donna. Just uh, recognizing that this is coming back to the next meeting for uh, for questions and a deeper dive. But if you have any uh, quick questions of clarification, uh, Councillor Cuddle. Um, no, I, I saw that note, too, that it will be coming back for for questions. So for now, I'll just say congratulations to Kate and the entire team. This is a real milestone. Here we go. I am so excited and um, I look forward to, you know, digging deep and supporting you on this. So, yay, here we go. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, much, much appreciated, uh, Kate and team. And, uh, we, uh, look forward to, uh, seeing you again at committee, uh, next month where we'll, uh, we'll have a chance to, uh, digest the report and, uh, and do a, a deeper dive. So, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, moving on to, uh, 16 notices of motion. Do we have any notices of motion? I actually do. Uh, just trying to exit my full screen here. Sure thing. Uh, okay, so there. I have two notices of motion uh, through the ghost hand of Councillor Mason, since he's no longer on our <laughs> committee. Uh, okay. So uh, take notice at the next uh, Community Planning Economic Standing Committee, I will introduce a motion 
to request a staff report regarding the clarification of standards in the construction mitigation policies, policy and administrative order 2018-005 ADM to clarify when a temporary sidewalk will be required or a temporary crosswalk if a sidewalk or temporary sidewalk cannot be provided on one side of the street and two, require a reduction in the extent of the encroachment as stages of construction progress. So that would be uh, the first one. The second notice of motion is take notice that the next community planning economic standing committee, uh, I will request a staff report regarding possible options and opportunities to create an HRM wide parks advisory committee. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, any other notices of motion? All right, uh, seeing none, moving on to uh, item 17, public participation. And we have one registered speaker joining us this morning. It is the uh, the Honorable Steve Craig, NLA for Sackville Cobbequid. And uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, MLA Craig is uh, on, the, uh, on the line, go ahead, sir. And welcome, welcome back. There we go. You see me. Welcome, sir. I can see all of you. Listen, thank you very much. Nice to see you all. And I know that in these days of COVID in the last 14 months, you've had quite the challenge. This council has had the challenges that previous councils have never had. And, and I do thank you for all your efforts and doing your very best under these extremely trying circumstances to help all of our citizens. And uh, you have my, as always, utmost respect each and every one of you. And uh, it was nice to see that Sam Austin, uh, Councillor Austin has not changed his modus um, the way he operates. He usually comes into the meeting late and uh, today he was the last one in too. So uh, I'm glad to see Sam is not changing. Councillor Austin, pardon me, is not changing. Madam Chair, to you, uh, through you, to all of the councillor colleagues who are on the call, I do want to thank you all for your service. And, uh, and I do watch. And I do pay attention from time to time on topics that interest me uh, as it impacts all of HRM Nova Scotia and in particular Sackville and Beaverbank area, of course, <laughs> and Lucasville, absolutely. The reason I wanted to appear today was to just absolutely express my delight in the evaluation report that's come back through this committee who just over three years ago, uh, my motion and seconded by Councillor Blackburn set this in motion. It was council that approved it eventually, and it was staff though that carried this off with the community. And I'd like to pay particular mention to Angela Green, uh, Lee Moore, both who appeared here today before you, but also Mickey McDowell, Becca Bishop, and Heather McLeod. And I had been to the, from day one, uh, I've been in the den and the den name came about from the youth. It was the youth who were engaged and picked that name, the den. And aptly uh, nice so that people can go in there. They can feel supported. They can feel uh, welcomed and build trust and respect with their peers and with those who are there to help them. It was mentioned earlier that um, there were challenges. And part of the challenges in my experience have been around when you collaborate with others, it's not what you get out of it often, it's what you're willing to give up, that's one. But two, when you take a look at the collaboration with the YMCA, IWK, Langhouse, Boys and Girls Clubs, the Sackville Library was fantastic and is fantastic. Posse, which is the Peer Outreach Support Services and Education Group, McPhee Center. Um, we've got the Cobbequid Youth Health Center, HRM, Parks and Rec, naturally, who step up. It was HRM who took the, who took and gave the ability to those other organizations who were basically centralized, admittedly, where the most density was when they were set up in the peninsula of Halifax in the Dartmouth area. You know, so in the center core is where a lot of these organizations had their genesis and it's where they provided services, but they do want to do outreach. They want to engage. 
And so with HRM providing the facility to do that and the staff and the willingness to, to do that, it was the youth that benefited. When we talk about the, the ongoing budget challenges, let, let us not forget, please, that it is not only HRM that has these budget challenges. It is those organizations that I've already mentioned and other not-for-profits who are struggling, especially in these last 14 months, to serve their clientele. So if you want to do outreach, you need the staff, you need the funding, which often comes from grants from governments. It comes from the private sector and donations from individuals like yourselves. They need the support as well. So when we take a look at how do we engage those, I would humbly ask that you recognize and that staff recognizes the challenges that a lot of these other organizations have too, and many of them who I've talked with in the last 24 months ongoing. So the challenges are there. It is our youth who are suffering. It is, uh, and I see it in my current capacity, which uh, Councillor Austin uh, talked about as a demotion. And, uh, and, and I accept that in so much as it is often you who are at the municipal level, who are front and center in front of the people. You have the, your feet are on the ground, you're there, and uh, the provincial representatives are there too. And having had my foot on both sides, I will readily admit that it is at the municipal level where you see things up front and personal every single day. Not to say that we don't, but you see it in a much different way. So I take the comment about the motion kindly, Councillor Austin, through you, the chair, uh, Councillor Blackburn. I just wanted to say again, I, I, to, to grow this outside of where we had the pilot project, bear in mind that the organizations that were looked at is, um, is important, but the, those organizations will be the same organizations that are trying to serve their current clients. They are trying to do outreach and they too will have challenges to outreach into different areas, especially where the demand and the facilitation, if you will, is expanded beyond what it is now, given especially these challenging times. So Madam Chair, I wanted to thank you and uh, take this opportunity. It's not often I, I get back. I, I don't recognize chambers here. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've done a bit of uh, redecorating, yes. <laughs> I see that. Talk about decentralization. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Madam Chair, I, I thank you. I thank uh, your fellow colleagues and I thank the staff, especially the staff who take the policy and the direction of council and actually make it happen. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, MLA. Steve Craig, much appreciated. Great to uh, have your voice on this uh, important. We, uh, I think uh, we can refer to you as the uh, the godfather of the den because you were the, uh, the <laughs> champion of this from the very beginning. And uh, so you, you have seen the uh, success that this project has had firsthand. Appreciate your, your time here this morning and thank you. Thank you. All right, we have uh, no other public speakers uh, signed up. So uh, the date of our next meeting is uh, June the 17th, 2021. And uh, just uh, just a little bit over, over time, but looking for a, a motion to adjourn. To adjourn, Madam Chair. All right, we have the motion from Councillor Lovelace. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, your, uh, your patience and uh, your work this morning and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you all soon. Take care. Thank you so much, uh, Simon and uh, the clerk's office for uh, production assistance today. You guys rock. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Sam.